Hello, and welcome back to The Gateway. Thank you for joining us for Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, we love the Word of God and happy to get back into it. Uh, before we get started tonight, just a little bit of review from last week. Just We're just going to touch a couple things and we're going to jump into tonight's study. Um, last week, we saw, uh, of course, Paul, the other prisoners, uh, Luke and Aristarchus, who were his friends who were not prisoners, and then the Roman soldiers and the sailors were all on the ship, and they were in a storm, and the storm was bad, and uh, they went for several days not seeing the stars or anything because the storm was so, I guess, so consuming that it blacked out everything. And so what the sailors did, they started lightening the ship. So they started throwing tackle, the ship's tackle, anchors, uh, you know, supplies overboard to lighten the ship so it would ride uh, higher in the water and hopefully avoid uh, reefs or sandbars or things that could, could, could you know, and says, an angel of the Lord stood before me last night and said, because of God's favor on you, Paul, God has granted the lives of everyone else on the ship. And then, of course, Paul, when he shares that with the people, uh, he says, be encouraged. You're not going to your head will be lost. And so they, Paul uh, gives thanks and breaks bread and passes it out, and all of them eat, encouraged and strengthened. Then the next morning, uh, whenever the, 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 the daylight happens, look and they see an island that they don't recognize and that's actually the island of Malta which we're going to talk a little bit about tonight and the, the sailors decide to um, just run the ship aground I mean they're going to run the ship right up on the uh, the, the edge the, the shore of that island and make it to safety so they cut the anchor ropes that were holding uh, from the back of the ship and they're heading straight to the little inlet and they run it run a ship aground there was this um, unseen uh, is this little uh, underwater land mass that was kind of coming out that was between them and where they were going to run the ship. And so they get stuck there. The waves bash around and break the ship apart. And so everybody uh, gets off the ship. Those who can swim, swim. Those who don't know how to swim or can't swim get on boards and other floating objects. All of them make it safely to this island. And that's actually where we're picking up today. We're picking up in Acts chapter 28. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 through 16. All right, so here we go. And my laptop is not working, so hold on a second. Here we go. Electronic issues. I know none of you have ever dealt with uh, computer problems or electronic issues. Me, because uh, I'm joking with you, all of us deal with it. So here we go. So it's Acts chapter 28, verse 1 through 16. In verse 1, it says, after we had safely reached land, we discovered that the island we were on was Malta. The island was Malta. Um, formerly, actually, this was the, the newer name for that island uh, in that time. But before, it was actually called Melita. And uh, Melita was, uh, it's kind of neat because Melita actually means honey sweet. In Greek, Melita means honey sweet. And uh, it had that reputation because uh, it had produced large quantities of extremely good honey. Um, in the past, and so the island was called Melita, but they had, I guess, started calling it Malta uh, in that time period whenever Paul and those crashed and got on the island. Uh, but even today, uh, the honey from that island is uh, known to be some of the best in the world. Um, so anyway, one day maybe I'll try the Melita honey, uh, and maybe you can too. I think it's called Maltese honey. That's the name of the honey now. It's called Maltese honey. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm going to look on Amazon and maybe order a little jar just to see what it's about and see how good it is. Um, so we're going to look at a map of Malta now. So if you look at your, your screen, this is an old map, but this is actually the island of Malta. And you see even in this map, um, it's called Melita. And, um, but I want you to notice, if you look at the bottom left of the map, you'll see a little, uh, a little legend that's, that's the bigger scope, which actually has a larger view, but also it has a portion of the Mediterranean as well as where this island is. And I put two little red arrows on there. You'll see the one red arrow, the one kind of towards the bottom, that is actually pointing to this island of Malta. And that's where it's at in the Mediterranean. And you'll see the, the other red arrow pointing up, that's actually pointing to Rome. So that's where they were heading. Uh, and their ship crashes, it sinks, um, and then they get off and swim to this island of Malta. Um, but once again, they were heading to Rome see them get there uh, today, but um, or, or get close. 
So anyway, that's just a little map of what the island looked like. And it was known, once again, for having exceptional honey. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then we see in verse 2, it says, The people who lived there showed us extraordinary kindness. These were the native islanders who lived there, as well as I'm sure some people who were, who were not native to the place but had, were living there. Um, it says, For they welcomed us around the fire they had built because it was cold and rainy. Uh, the storm was still going on, church. I mean, it was still storming, it was still raining, it was still nasty weather, and it was cold. And you can imagine Paul and all of the, his companions and the soldiers and everyone had just swam out of the ocean. So, I mean, this is October. I mean, it's believed to be right sometime in October. And so it's October. It's raining. It's cold. It's storming. They're soaking wet. Uh, we're happy to find a fire. And, uh, but it says they showed, the native people showed them extraordinary kindness. Um, it's pretty neat. They built a fire for them, and they were helping them warm up. That is really kind. I mean, I'm sure that everybody appreciate that fire. Um, so, and then we see in verse 3, it says, When Paul had gathered an armful of brushwood and was setting it on the fire, a venomous snake was driven out by the heat and latched onto Paul's hands. Some translations say viper. Um, what the pit viper family is. I was raised in South Carolina, and we had lots of water moccasins and rattlesnakes. Um, yes, and they're aggressive, and they're nasty, and they will bite you. Um, but so Paul, he he grabs some uh, an armload of wood, and he sets it on the fire. But there's a snake in the wood that he doesn't know about. And as soon as he sets the wood down and the heat hits it, the snake grabs and latches onto his hand and bites him. And this thing is this thing is actually hanging on to his hand. It looks like it's hanging on to his hand. Latch stones is hanging on. You know, snakes will do that. Boy, they'll bite you. And the, and the pit viper, they actually, most of the time, if they have a, the option, they won't just bite you once. They'll actually chew. They'll chew and uh, do as much damage as they can. Um, they're very effective predators. So the snake's on his hand. It's biting him. It's chewing on him. Uh, and so that's not good. Um, then in verse 4, it says, When the hour saw the snake dangling from Paul's hand, they said to one another, No doubt about it. This guy is a murderer. Even though he escaped death at the sea, justice has now caught up with him. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about these, these two verses here. Okay? Um, and we're going we're gonna to kind of expand the scope a little bit and apply this to our lives and to other people's lives. You know, whenever... Uh, Paul and the group show up to this campfire. You've got the native people there, and they have a fire going. And then Paul and his group comes up, and Paul says, hey, I want to help. I'm going to pitch in. I'm going to contribute to this fire. And whenever he tries to contribute, um, as soon as he, he puts his efforts in and, and puts his labor in with the natives, a uh, snake comes out and bites him. Um, and church, I want to say that very much this would apply to us, um, you know, at the, at the gateway. So if you're watching this and you're part of the Gateway family, you know, when a visitor comes into the church, um, you know, they don't really know what's going on. We're considered the natives to them, all right? So they come in, they see what we're doing, they see, hey, children's ministry or worship team or whatever, and they see a spot where they want to get involved. And then they get involved. And start working closely with people. Whenever we start getting involved in a new ministry or something, a lot of times, uh, if there's anything off in our character or there's something in our life that God wants to work on, working closely with others will often reveal it. Because, you know, the closer you work with people, the more friction is generated, the more heat is generated. There's going to be some interactions that, are, you know, maybe uh, rub you wrong. You know, you might get a little upset. You might get a little aggravated. But the thing is, is um, that is... Close working relationships are one of the primary vehicles God uses to expose things we need to change. And so, you know, just like the heat of the fire, the heat of those moments, those interactions will reveal that we need to work with and work with. Um, and so that's what happened. Paul was, hey, Paul had a good attitude, a good heart. He got in there with the natives. He was going to contribute to the, to the fire. He was going to contribute to the work there. He was going to try to do his part. And what happens? He got bit. How many times have you had a good attitude, a good motive, and got involved in something, and as soon as you're working with it, next thing you know, you get bit. Something, something rubs you wrong, something irritates you, something, and you, something inside of you rise up, and it's not as pretty as uh, well as you'd hoped it would be. And that's very much what happened here. Um, 
But in, let's look at verse 4. It says, when the islanders, when those native people saw the snake dangling from Paul's hand, you know, whenever people come into the church and they're, and they're working in a ministry and uh, there's a tough interaction or whatever, um, you know, the leaders of that ministry or the leaders in the church will watch and say, huh, okay. I see. Um, saw the snake. They said to one another, no doubt about it, this guy's a murderer. Even though he escaped death at sea, justice has now caught up with him. Um, you know, I think the islanders were reading into it a little much here. Um, they said, you know, the, the, the sea didn't kill him, but obviously he needed to die. So justice has caught up with him. And when they say this, um, justice, uh, the implication in this Greek phrase here, this Greek word term, term is that they were, they were referring to the Greek goddess of justice. Uh, this was actually, uh, you, you've seen these symbols, uh, probably. If you've seen the old carving and statues of the woman, uh, the woman with the dress and the, the balances, the two little balances, you know, with the chains, she was, she's holding the balances. That is the, that is the Greek goddess of justice, so to speak. Um, and I forgot what her name is. I think it was, I don't remember her name right now, what they call her, but that's what they were. These, this was a superstitious people. They were idolaters. And so they said, oh, okay, he might have he might have avoided dying at sea, but uh, the Greek goddess of justice is still going to make him pay for his crime. And so that's what they were saying here. Um, but, you know, they were overreacting because, you know, they should have just said, well, man, I don't know what happened here. I'm sorry, man. Is there anything we can do to help? Um, which is the right way to respond in a church setting. If somebody is, is working in a, on, in a ministry and they get upset, they get stirred up. Um, the leaders in the church need to not jump to conclusions and just say, hey, we love you, we care about you. You know, always give people the benefit of the doubt. So while there is some really good uh, church application here, there's also a good example of overreaction here. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, everybody needs time to, to adapt, to become part of the family, to connect. And we do, we give that at the gateway. Now, it doesn't always work for everybody. I mean, some people, it's just not the best fit for them. And, you know, eventually they have to move on to something else because God's going to lead them elsewhere. But for the most part, I mean, we're going to definitely give people the benefit of the doubt and, uh, and love people, even if, even if something surfaces in their life that's not that pretty, because all of us have things in us that ain't that pretty. And we have grace for each other. All right. Amen. So let's keep going. In verse 5, it says, But Paul shook the snake off, flung it into the fire, and suffered no harm at all. Let's stop for a second right there. Um, look how Paul responded. I mean, he, he was trying to help. He was trying to contribute, and something nasty came out. And people were like, whoa, they saw the nasty thing come out. But what did Paul do? Paul didn't walk away from the fire. He didn't walk away from the ministry he was committed to. He didn't walk away from his commitment to, the, to his local church. What it is, the nasty thing was revealed, and he shook the nasty thing off in the same fire that revealed it. And see, that's the way we have to deal with things. Whenever we're in an interaction and something's not going well, you know, we don't pack up our toys and go home. You know, we don't say, I'm done with this. Yeah, we don't do that, church. What we do is if something's revealed, we say, hmm, I don't like it. It's not pretty, but I'm not going to walk away from the table. I'm not going to pack up my stuff and go to another church. I'm not going to do this. Now, if God's leading you, that's one thing. But don't, don't ever leave a church or leave a commitment just because you're mad, angry, or your pride's been hurt. Uh, don't do it. Uh, just stay right there. Say, Jesus, help me. I want to learn from this. Jesus, I know there's, there's good here because you cause all things to work together for good for me because I love you. What is in this that's good? I want it. And what you do is you stay there. You shake that nasty thing off in the fire and let it go. And then you move up with God and move on in the kingdom. Um, so in verse six, it says, everyone watched him expecting him to swell up or suddenly drop dead <laughs> after observing him for a long time and seeing that nothing unusual happened. They changed their minds and said, he must be a God. Um, you know, the group around, they're watching, they're watching snake bit Paul. They're watching the man who had the viper chewing on his hand. They're saying, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to, you're going to swell up something. You're going to swell up. Something's going to happen. You're going to fall over dead. Who knows? But we're watching. We're keeping an eye on you. But see, nothing happened to him because guess what? He was in the will of God. He was on the on track with God, and nothing bad happened to him at all. 
And so after that, they said he must be a god. You, you see that, that superstitious, idolatry, idolatrous uh, thing that was going on in that, that, that region, particularly with that island. You know, they go from uh, saying the goddess of justice is going to kill him to, oh, he must be a god himself. So you can, you can see that idolatry. It was very predominant in that region in that time period. I mean, a lot of those gods were, I mean, they were originated on some of the islands, like the island of Crete. They had gods that were from there. They had deities and these, I don't know, they were just very, um, I don't know, idolatry, idolatrous, superstitious people. So anyway, opinion on Paul. So let's keep going. In verse 7, it says, The Roman governor of the island named Publius, had his estate nearby. He graciously welcomed us as his house guest and showed us hospitality for the three days that we stayed with him. So this is pretty cool because, um, you know, this man, he was, uh, he was the governor of that island, but he graciously welcomed them as his house guest. I mean, those guys went from a, a, a terrible time on the ship to the ship sinking, to swimming ashore, to um, being treated nice by the native people of the island, you know, build a fire, and now they go over here to the governor, and he welcomes it, welcomes them as his house guest. How cool is that? I mean, they went from a tough spot to a much better situation. Um, but Paul and his friends, this governor's residence or one of his other uh, houses on his property or on the island's property for three days. So they stayed there for three days. And then in verse 8, his father, talking about the governor of the island, his father lay sick in bed, suffering from fits of high fever and dysentery. So Paul went into his room and after praying, placed his hands on him and he was instantly healed. And let's read verse 9 and we'll talk about these two verses. It says, when the island heard about this miracle, they brought all the sick to Paul and they were also healed. You know, the this interesting Paul the prisoner on the way to home, on the way to Rome to stand trial. Remember, Paul's not guilty of anything, but he's on the way to Rome to stand trial before Caesar, who was Emperor Nero at that time. And so he's on the way to do that. And on the way, they, the boat crashes. They get on this island and look at the look at the prisoner Paul, the prisoner one free from sickness and disease. And that's something. The prisoner is the one setting him free. Hmm. And that very much the same way it was with Jesus. I mean, Jesus was belittled. Jesus was, uh, he was arrested. He was locked up. He was beaten and abused and he was murdered. And guess what? Jesus set us free. Jesus set us all free. Everybody who trusts in him, everybody who calls him is saved and set free. Mm. Same thing with Paul here. The prisoner Paul is the one who's setting them free. Now, I just want you to imagine for a second. <laughs> imagine this setting. You're on this island. You've got all these natives around you. Not only have you got natives, you've got the governor who's right there watching. You've got the Roman soldiers there. You've got the sailors. You've got all these people, this, this audience. And here's Paul. He goes into the room with this, this man's father. And this man's in bad shape. Dysentery is no joke. And he's in bad shape. And Paul prays for him and instantly he's healed. And then guess what? Everybody says, wow, it, man, if, if, if God can heal this man through Paul, we're going to get everybody else on the island who's sick and let him pray for them too. What a moment. Can, and, and one thing too is I want to just imagine through the eyes of that centurion, that Roman centurion. Can you imagine him watching the prisoner Paul? This is the same Paul that had prophesied to them that the ship and everybody on it was And guess what? Everybody lived. So Paul's credibility was way up. And now Paul prays for a man that was probably going to die. Um, and, and he's healed. I can't imagine the, you know, for those people to see Jesus touch lives like that, what it, what it must have done to them to see that firsthand. It's amazing. And every time I've seen the Lord heal somebody, I've seen people healed physically. I've seen people healed emotionally. I've seen people healed spiritually. Uh, you know, whenever they trust Christ. 
And every time I see it, my heart soars. And, uh, and I'm a Christian, and I've seen a good bit of it, but I still soar every time. Can you imagine for a non-believer who saw that, what it would do? I mean, they'd have a God moment. I mean, go from zero to a Honored us greatly, um, and when we were prepared to set, set sail again, they gave us everything, all the supplies, food, provisions that we needed for our journey. You know, church. Um, you know, Paul had blessed them. The man of God had 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 went to that place. I mean, Paul wasn't planning to go to Malta, but but uh, God had planned for Paul to go to Malta. And so, when Paul's in Malta, he he, he represented Jesus. And he let, allowed the Holy Spirit to flow through him and change lives. And guess what? All those whose lives were changed were grateful. And they responded by giving provision and supplies and things that were needed. Um, it's beautiful. You know, the Bible says the laborer is worthy of his wages. You know, don't muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Let it eat too. That's what the scripture's talking about. The ox is the one working the field and working the stuff. That's the minister. That's the the Christian who's out here praying for people and doing this stuff. Don't Muslim. They, they need to be. Sources came in that they needed because, uh, because God was um, taking care of them. And so in verse 11 and uh, 12, it says, after three months, we put out to sea on an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that had wintered at the island. Uh, the ship had carved on its prow as its emblem the heavenly twins. When we landed Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And you'll notice on your, your, your PowerPoint image, I've got three months and three days underlined. And then back in verse 7, we saw three days at the governor's house. Uh, three is a big number. Uh, three is significant in the Bible. Three is a number for God. It just represents God. because God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The three, and the three who are one. So we got the three individual gods who are our one God, which sounds strange, but that's called the Trinity. They are one. They're a complete unity, complete power, complete, uh, they know everything, complete omniscience. Uh, so the three who are one, that is our God. So there's three individuals who are our one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so the number three represents that, but I want you to, to also see that here where it says three months. So they were on the on that island for three months, which seriously represents God's presence was on that island for three months. Amen. And it says whenever they landed in Syracuse, they stayed there for three days. There, that was a God assignment there too. Um, so that's a big deal. But I want to talk a little bit about the heavenly twins that they caught. That's once again, the superstition stuff. I mean, the idolatry, it's everywhere. So this ship has on its prow the emblem of the heavenly twins. Um, and actually, the, these two twins were called Castor and Pollux. And they, these were, they were viewed as two semi-deities. Uh, they were reputed to be twin brothers, the son of Jupiter and Leda. Uh, they were supposed to preside over sailors. They were supposed to protect sailors. And so it wasn't uncommon to have their images on the ships. So that's just a little information about what I mean by the heavenly twins. These were these two twin brothers who protected sailors according to the idolatry of the day. Right? And so, um, let's see here. I want to say one other thing about um, the, the number three. Remember, um, you know, number three is significant because we actually see it used in the Bible about 380 times. 380 times, roughly, the number three appears in the Bible. So it's a significant number. And when it says, actually, talking about landing at Syracuse, Syracuse, actually, that was, a, that was a city on the eastern coast of Sicily. So you, we saw what, on the map, we saw down from Sicily. Sicily was the next large land mass on the way to Italy and on the way to Rome. So they landed there on that ship, and so now they're in Cilicia. Cilicia. <laughs> or, <laughs> or Sicily, Sicily. <laughs> Tongue twister. All right. Tongue twister for me anyway. 
And so in, uh, in 13, it says, From there we set sail for the Italian, Italian city of uh, Regium. The day after we landed, a south wind sprang up that enabled us to reach Petuli, Petoli in two days. Uh, in 14, it says, There we found some believers who begged us to stay with them for a week. Afterwards, we made our way to Rome. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about these two cities. Uh, the first one in verse 13 is the Italian city of uh, Regium. Uh, that was actually a city in Italy. It was on the coast near the southwest edge of Italy. So they went from Sicily straight across the water to that southwestern point on Italy, and that's where this city was. So they landed there. And then when it says they went on to uh, P Putoli, Putulia, I don't know, I'm pronounce it wrong, I'm sure. You know, that's, I don't speak Greek, <laughs> but we're trying. So Petuli. Um, actually, that was a city uh, on the western coast of Italy, but it had a road leading to Rome. And this is really neat. Um, the road was actually going to Rome. It was about 145 miles from that city of Petuli to Rome. So they had 145 miles north was Rome. Uh, Petuli actually is a Latin, Latin word which means little wells, like little wells of water. Um, and actually it was named that first mineral springs. Apparently the town has, uh, has um, very high quality mineral springs, you know, warm mineral springs, and that's why the town's named Little Wells or Petoli. Um, and that town's actually about eight miles northwest from Naples, Italy. And once again, in verse 14, it says, They found some believers who begged us to stay with them for a week. Afterward, we made our way to Rome. I mean, this is, a, this is a kind of interesting that Paul the prisoner, he's getting to visit with his friends and hang out. And, you know, can you imagine the favor on Paul at this point? I mean, he prophesied that everybody would live when the ship sank, and they did. He, he came onto the island healed apparently most if not all the sick people on the island and everybody saw that um, and then they got all this favor and provisions and that was in no small part due to to God using Paul on that island and everybody saw that and now um, you can see the favor because you know he's, he's visiting with some of the other believers just a lot of favor on Paul and in verse 15 it says when the believers were alerted we were coming they came out to meet us at the form of a pious while we were still a great distance from Rome. Another group met us at three taverns. When Paul saw the believers, his heart was greatly encouraged, and he thanked God. A um, couple of thoughts with that is uh, these people came out to meet Paul. Um, and we, we have to understand it was just a few years earlier. I don't remember exactly how many years earlier. It was four to eight years. I, I, I may be off a, few, a couple years, but Paul had written the letter to Rome, to the Romans, you know, the, in our Bible, the book of Romans. He had written that letter a few years prior to this. So these believers in that area, they knew of Paul. Paul had a, an amazing reputation as a, as a, as a, a, a fired-up man of God. So they, uh, they had read his epistle uh, to them, his, his letter to them, and so they, they rushed, rushed out to meet him. And so that's one reason there was such, um, such excitement for the Apostle Paul coming to Rome is because his letter had been circulated in the church group there. All right. So but what it says, uh, they came out to meet him at the Forum of a, of a Pius. That's actually a big deal because uh, there, there's a lot of history with this, but we're going to talk about it a little bit. The Forum of a Pius was a little over 40 miles away from Rome. This city was built on the Pian Way, uh, which was the road from Rome to Coppa. Um, and actually, when it says the form of Apias, the form actually was the marketplace. It means the marketplace of Apias. And the PN Way is actually was a road that was built from 312 to 264 B.C. So for 48 years, this road was being built. And when it was completed, it spanned 350 miles. And so this form of Apias was this marketplace on this Roman road and it was, uh, it was actually a known, a known marketplace for travelers to stop and buy supplies or get refreshments or whatever they needed at this marketplace as they traveled on this Roman road to Rome. Um, and so um, it, was, uh, it was actually known as a significant marketplace in that day. And so three taverns, when it talks about another group met us at three taverns, um, three taverns was about 30 miles from Rome. So they're, they're, they're making their journey to Rome on this highway. Um, and so I want, to talk, I want to show you a picture of this highway. 
This is a picture of the, the Appian Way, or that road. This road, I mean, it, they built it for 48 years. It actually had stones laid in. They used sand in between the stones to kind of pack it down. Um, and that road went for 350 miles, and it took 48 years to build. It's beautiful, and it's impressive. There are other pictures online if you want to look at it. But it's called the, actually, the Appian, A-P-P-I-A-N Way. There's a lot of pictures of it on there, but I have to stick with public domain images. <laughs> so you can check it out if you want to. It's, it's quite quite the accomplishment to build a road like that in that time period. Um, and so in closing today, it says, When they finally entered Rome, Paul was turned over to the authorities and was allowed to live where he pleased, with one soldier assigned to guard him. So Paul the prisoner makes it to Rome and, and chooses his own house. <laughs> Talk about the favor of God. Man, he had favor all over him. And look how productive his journey was. It, was, it had some hardship and some difficulty. But he changed the lives of many people. I mean, and plus, everybody who traveled him, their lives were changed by the presence of God and the ministry of God through Paul. And so he had one soldier signed to guard him, and he was uh, in Rome at that point. And so we're going to wrap up the study tonight. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it's neat that Paul the prisoner is, I mean, just changing lives all the way to Rome. Wow. Church, uh, you change lives at every step you can. You change lives on your journey to heaven. You change lives every step of the way. Get in there and help people and pray for them and bless them and love them and lay hands on them and, and, and ask God for his best for them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. God, we love you so much. You are faithful. You are good. You're wonderful. Oh, Jesus, we give you praise. Lord, I pray you bless everyone who's watching tonight. God, if, if they have a need, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you'd heal them. God, if they have a physical or an emotional need. God, if somebody's watching this, they don't know you, Jesus, I pray they would call out to you and trust you as their Lord and Savior. And God, I just thank you for all you're doing in my life and my family. And God, I thank you for everything you're doing in the lives of everyone who's watching because you're with them too and you're blessing them too no matter who it is. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we will see you next Tuesday for Bible study or hopefully this Sunday for drive-in service. J.C. Penny Parking Lot, Squim, Washington. Thanks. Bye-bye.